Hi, everybody. It's uh, Tuesday afternoon. And uh, just let me know that you can all hear me okay by shooting a yes at me on the uh, chat. Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, Dr. K, you there? I am here. Okay. Uh, Bill, you there? Right here. He's coming. He is. Okay. Everybody's set to go. Uh, well, you guys uh, got to uh, listen to uh, three of uh, my recorded webinars yesterday, which were a lot of fun because the technology wasn't really up to par, probably because of bandwidth issues. But anyways, at the end of the day and, and after the close, I wasn't too keen on what I saw in the market. And of course, I was I blew out of stuff, uh, moving to cash and not really being very committed right now. And I'm glad I wasn't because this morning you saw a lot of stocks, especially the stuff stocks. Oils, commodity-related stocks just got pummeled today, uh, and a few other things got pummeled as well. Now, the interesting thing here is we are still on a buy signal on the market direction model, and uh, you did pick up volumes of another distribution day on the S&P, but you held the 50-day moving average, which I believe you can see here. Let me make it bigger. Uh, yeah, just a little bit under it, but you're trying to hold it, so it's possible you might get a bounce out of here. And then see how things go from there. But that's pretty much what you're looking at on this pullback. So you come down, it looks pretty scary here. Uh, we're still in QE2. So for all you know, you're going to bounce and come out again. You really don't know for sure. But they really did whack a number of leaders in the oil sector. Uh, some of the metals that have come up, uh, the mining stocks got raked. Uh, surprisingly enough, though, uh, silver held above $40 on the futures contract. Uh, the NASDAQ index. Is below its 50 day moving average. We did not pick up volume today, so today was not a distribution day, oddly enough. So to me, this is kind of a screwy market. And my uh, my tack right now is just to, to blow it off and not really mess with it. I don't really see any high probability plays or a few things that looked okay uh, in terms of uh, some of the technical action on individual stocks. There's just a handful of stocks. I'll go through those in a little bit. Uh, but first, I want Dr. K to. Uh, come in here and give us a rundown on where the model is at and what might need to happen in order for a signal uh, change to occur. Dr. K? Well, um, essentially, enough, if, if the model gets uh, uh, enough distribution days or and or uh, poor action on the part of the leaders, that would be enough to move it into at least a cash signal. Uh, so far, the model has logged two distribution days of a NASDAQ composite. And in this Pomo environment, uh, as we all know, the averages can drift higher on low volume for many days. And uh, in this late, you know, as of late market environment, uh, we're seeing some bifurcation where some leaders are acting okay while, while others aren't. And uh, so it's um, understandable if one feels unconvinced in the market's general direction at this point. Um, the model remains on a buy, and uh, it's certainly. Uh, possible that this signal could change to it would I would probably say a cash signal would be the next step rather than a sell signal if if uh, leaders were to start to fail um, across the board so for now we're on a buy yeah and I would say you know, the same thing basically it's if you if you're doubting this market um, I would say it is a type of environment where you can die a death of a thousand cuts just from getting dinged around on everything. And then the action intraday is very uneven and almost bizarre at times. So for, for me, it's like, why, why bother playing? So um, the things that have acted well, let me NASDAQ chart uh, here and pull up uh, my daily. <clears throat> so we'll look at the chart there of Apple. But uh, you know, silver, everybody's asking us about silver, which is understandable given the fact that uh, it's come off. You had a couple of days of big volume in the SLV. But what I, what I would note here is you had a very sharp uh, move up. It's always interesting to me that when something is moving up sharply like this, nobody really gets concerned about that. But you get a couple of days of volume selling on something and everybody gets concerned. But notice one thing. It really has it's held up pretty well. Uh, you haven't really broken down too much. Yeah, you're getting hit with some volume. But you could just kind of go sideways here for a while, as I discussed yesterday after the close. And maybe you meet up with the 20-day moving average which is so far has served as a guide uh, for support. And so we're sticking with our silver position. That's really the only thing we're staying with. The silver and the gold uh, seem to be acting just fine. GLD also, you know, and, and what happens very quickly is people get real excited about them and then uh, they come in for one or two days and everybody seems to forget about them. And what I notice here is that uh, gold comes right back to the 
apply points, or maybe it's viable right here on this pullback, and then we can come into it. I don't really see anything changing with the budget situation. Supposedly, President Obama is going to have a speech tomorrow talking about how the U.S. is going to take responsibility for paying off its debts. But let's get real. The only way that the U.S. is going to start making a dent in its deficit is by running budget surpluses. And as far as I'm concerned, that has about a snowball's chance in hell of happening. Um, and on top of that, for those of you who don't know, the U.S. government, uh, the budget numbers that they come up with are all based on cash accounting. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about cash accounting, cash accounting is basically uh, just balancing off cash that comes in versus cash that goes out. It doesn't take into account any other liabilities or any other uh, forward liabilities in the numbers. That would be taken care of by using accrual accounting. And the U.S. government, ironically, requires that businesses which make over a million dollars in revenues must use accrual accounting because you can uh, engage in a lot of deception by just using cash accounting. Of course, that's why the government uses cash accounting. So, you know, there's a lot of deception and fraud at a very basic level that goes on. on. So I don't really give the government, U.S. government, much credibility when they start talking about doing something about the budget. Because in order to do something about the budget, they're going to have to start running surpluses, which I really don't see happening. Therefore, the trend in commodities should continue. Dr. K, your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting that silver had a very high volume reversal day yesterday. And in the past, when it's done that, um, well, it, it, it's it's held its ground and uh, it might correct for a few days, but then it goes higher. And after today's action, I, I thought we would, uh, we would we would come off uh, more than what we did today. In fact, it looked like it was getting some support, and the mid the, the close on the day was close to the mid bar point. So that's a pretty positive sign. The market's telegraphing that they realize that the Fed's going to continue to uh, devalue the dollar. And so that brings up the issues with some of these uh, other uh, commodities. The JJS is one we're talking about, where we have been talking about. It's down to the 65-day exponential, and it's held. Uh, I would say, based on the fact that this is underperforming, I'd prefer to be in the silver and the gold. Now, DBC, of course, got whacked today, and it had a nice move up. The wonderful thing about this, and this is what's sometimes frustrating about the long side of this market when you're long anything, is it takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days to rally about 7%, and then it gives up most of that in just two days. And you see some of that happen with stocks as well. And uh, that's a frustrating uh, set of circumstances to deal with. But even so, you have them pulling right back to the top. Today, Goldman Sachs came out and downgraded the commodities group and told everyone that they should be taking profits. And that's what hammered the group. And you saw that happening in oils like Contra Resources. I was quite surprised to see Baker Hughes break down. You notice it holds a 65-day exponential moving average, the black moving average. Uh, Halliburton also pulled down, held a 65-day moving average. But notice that these things came in, ra rallied up, bounced off the 50-day, 65-day, whatever you want to consider as a support level here. Rallies to new highs and then rolls over pretty hard. Uh, looking at things like uh, FCX, Freeport, Macmoran, that's a breakdown. Uh, some of the uh, fertilizers, is looking at those yesterday, continued to break down today. Um, tech research is in the coal area. Yesterday, I didn't like that. Uh, and it, it uh, had pushed down to the 50-day moving average. Now it's breaking the 50-day and the 65-day moving average. Look at the Arch Coal breaking down as well. Walter Energy acting a little better than the rest, but still breaking down pretty hard. And this is pretty hard to take because if you're you get long something in here on a pocket pivot, say for example, and it rallies up several days and looks good and looks in also the slam, uh, that's what I what I mean when I say you, you can die a death of a thousand cuts because it seems like things just kind of run up and then boom you'll get hit and now you'll be underwater and that may have happened two or three or four times and you end up uh, just lose consistently losing money. So I think it's environment not to be playing too heavy. That's the bottom line uh, for me right now. Uh, uh, also, Dr. K, going, any comments? Yeah, if you're going to uh, be invested in commodity-related stocks or ETFs, uh, note that many of these do trade in wide bands as they go higher. So in other words, they often will not um, obey the 10-day, and sometimes they don't obey the 50-day either. And so knowing that, it, you um, should be prepared for your position to uh, ebb and flow as it goes higher. And, and you can take a look at a number of these uh, ETFs uh, to see what I mean over the years. 
um, and they do go higher, but you have to have patience. And uh, I wanted to make one comment on JJS. That has a high correlation with MOO and DBA. And these are all agriculturally based uh, ETFs. So um, what you can do is when you're looking at JJS and you're seeing some weakness on the day or for over a couple of days, you can compare it to MOO and DBA, and that'll that'll reassure you uh, that either the position is is still okay or it needs to be sold. From what I'm seeing right now, um, JJS is getting awfully close to being sold, but but uh, it's still a hold, um, just simply because it's at the fifty uh, the sixty five day. MOO is also at the uh, 65 day, and uh, you have uh, DBA, which they're all at the 65 day. So, um, and DBA got some uh, support uh, coming into it as well as JJS. So, I think um, you know we'll we'll know over the next few days uh, whether we want to sit with this position or or or, uh, or bail from it. Let's take a poll real quick. I'm just curious how many of you uh, listening and watching out there think that the uh, JJS DBA. Uh, and the Moo are going to head lower. So just type in lower or higher, depending on what you think in here. Yeah, and don't let the uh, Goldman higher, Sachs lower, report. Higher. Don't let the Goldman Sachs report of today, uh, which actually I, I think that was a catalyst in a lot of the commodities selling off. They, they issued a report mm -hmm. saying they think commodities have popped. Somebody thinks JJS is a head and shoulders top. I like it. It looks like it's about even. So I'm, I'm glad to know we don't have a. Uh, a crowd of sheep out there that everybody seems to think uh, somewhat differently. Head and shoulders top on the JJS. Uh, it look, looks that way. Only thing about that is I don't really look at uh, head and shoulders tops uh, in terms of uh, daily charts. I would tend to look at it on a weekly chart. It, it has that look. The only problem here is for the right side of the head, you don't really have a big uh, breakdown it actually comes down and it closes near the peak and it's a little bit different so th this is kind of funky but the other thing to note is over the last three weeks it's closed pretty tight along the low so it does seem like it's trying to find some supporter that it does have some support down here which does make sense uh given that uh given that you are at the uh 65 day exponential moving average so and I don't know, it may, it may become a point where uh, we, we consider the 65 day exponential not so much an oddity, but something that actually does work. And I was talking about uh, that yesterday after the close that uh, since so many use a 50 day and we often see things slide past. And of course, Dr. K and his work has accounted for this by requiring that things actually uh, violate the moving average rather than just close once below it. And a lot of times you will close below, but notice here, you close below, but you do violate it here, but you, you close uh, above the low here on this first break below. Here you, you break down below, but you don't violate. And here you've actually violated now in the 50 day, but you haven't broken the 65 day exponential. But I think a lot of this just speaks to the fact that it's a tricky market. And maybe you're gonna have to uh, back and fill here if you're going higher, and it may take some time, but uh, it's not like it's easy. So it just seems to me that for, for uh, effort, uh, it's very little return in terms of effort, uh, unless you uh, catch on to the lat or latch on to the right stocks like MCP, uh, which continues to act okay, try to sell off today and it's holding up pretty tight. I wouldn't be surprised to see this thing have a, a decent pullback though at some point. It's come straight up off the bottom and continues to move higher. Uh, but the rare earth metals uh, story remains a very strong one. Uh, interesting to see today that there were some pocket pivots. Uh, Zoomies, which is a retailer, uh, had a pocket pivot today, coming up off the 10-day moving average, surprisingly enough. Uh, and it was also interesting that with uh, some of the agricultural products uh, or agricultural ETFs like the DBA and the JJS and the Moo all selling off, I noticed that Corn Products International had a nice pocket pivot here back up through its uh, 10-day moving average. Now, we're long... Uh, the, Portfolio Simulator has not sold anything. It's 62.5% long, and it owns uh, uh, AZO, it owns Oracle, it owns uh, the SLV, the Silver ETF, and the DGP, which is the two times gold ETF. And it's actually holding up okay. So you know, that, the, the Portfolio Simulator might be telling you uh, that it, depending on uh, whether you pick the right stocks or not, you can be okay in this market. And you actually notice that 
AZO having broken out here. Now, the way I look at this pattern, some people ask if this is a wedging candle. Uh, I don't really, I don't really consider it that. I do consider it kind of a wedging rally, though. Here's the cup to me, and then here's your handle right here, this area. And then you break out to the handle, you move up, and so these pullbacks are just coming right back to the top of the handle, which looks normal. And then you get a pocket pivot in AutoZone today. So th this is actually a lot stronger than most stocks that you see in the market. So one of the things that uh, a pullback like today and a lot of ugly action can help you. Uh, figure out is what is acting pretty well. And then let's say the market does find support tomorrow. Uh, the S&P holds its 50 day, the NASDAQ fakes everyone out by rallying back above its 50 day. What stocks might be the ones that move? Well, the ones that acted well today, and, and you might look at the, the Zumi, CPO, AutoZone. Surprisingly, I thought uh, Chipotle, Mexican Grill, I guess things are getting so bad that people are just gonna be eating burritos from now on. But notice this. Uh, <laughs> Regardless of how skeptical you are of a company that just serves um, Mexican food, and I might add Mexican food that I don't really care for, but I know Dr. K, you're a big fan, aren't you? I like uh, Mexican of all all, all persuasions, actually. Uh, the one the stuff they've got here in London is pretty good. That would probably be a good place to open up a Mexican restaurant. In any case, what do you notice about today? Today is a pocket uh, pivot. So something points out that. Chipotle is soon going to have Asian food, so that would be good. I'd like to see some cheap sushi. Uh, but in any case, this is a little pocket pivot uh, coming up through here. So here you break out, and and this is again, you know, you you don't. I don't use the if you have a peak pattern, you come straight out. I don't really use the peak here as a pivot point. I'd rather be buying on a breakout through the, through the low part of the base, which uh, sometimes be a pocket pivot type move, like you have right in here. Uh, and it's breaking out and you have a pocket pivot volume signature. It's, it's better to come in there because I think your risk is lower than when they run out to new highs like this, then they're gonna pull back and you might get jammed out of your position. This thing comes down from like 282 uh, all the way back down into uh, 265. And then today we come out with a pocket pivot. So there's a stock just to put on your list because it's acting pretty strong today. Uh, GMCR, Green Mountain Coffee. Surprisingly enough, it's been moving in this ascending flag type of pattern. And today, although the volume is not really very heavy, it was a very subtle pocket pivot uh, move. Dr. Fay, do you consider that viable right here? Yeah, it is. That's a follow on pocket pivot after a very strong gap up in a fundamentally sound stock. Yeah, so it's possible you can come after some of these pocket pivots if the market holds up tomorrow. So I make my list on these. That's what I'm doing today. Uh, in terms of some of these stocks. I did point out yesterday that Biogen uh, had a viable gap up yesterday using the low here. You know, it tried to move higher, but it came in. A couple of the uh, biotechs that were acting pretty well uh, have sort of flopped out. Endo Pharmaceuticals coming back into the 10 day moving average. They're buying another company, but uh, I'm not sure why it was rallying yesterday, but they sure had that thing up in the reverse. But that doesn't look so hot right here. Um, you know, I was talking about racks yesterday, and I pointed out that even though it was holding well, I did try to come in and take a position here, but then I blew it out before the end of the day. And then today, as I said yesterday, it could break down into this uh, top of this base here, which seems like what it's doing now. So it's possible it could just pull back here and become viable and then turn back to the upside. Um, not really sure there, but Amazon was the other one I was talking about, and it's pulling back, picked up some volume, but that looks normal to me. So. Um, <clears throat> Baidu coming in it's back at the 10 day moving average. Dr. K, where do you see an entry point here, if at all? Well, I prefer buying on strength. And uh, the whole thing was uh, and yes, yesterday it was a bit extended um, because, as you can see, the low on yesterday's trade was a fair, a fair bit above the 10 day. So you wouldn't want to be buying it yesterday. You would have already want to have established a position in the stock and then wait for the next pocket pivot. That's going to be right, and as far as I can see, the last entry point was here on this breakout right here. Uh, or you could have come in on some of these pocket pivots that we actually flagged in the base. Not that they would have been necessarily that easy to hold on to, but they did uh, hold the 10 day moving average here, and then uh, we're able to come out on the breakout here. So, really, your only buy point for now is uh, the top of the base, and so there's no real entry point on uh, Baidu right now. 
Uh, a couple of other stocks to kind of nail. You're seeing Riverbed uh, breaking down, heading for the 200-day moving average. This, this is starting to look like a head and shoulders formation now. Here's the right shoulder. You've got a lot of selling volume on this thing. It's heading for the 200 days, but it looks like to me. Uh, it did undercut this low, so it might be logical for it to try and rally from here and form a right shoulder. I'd be keeping an eye on that. Monsanto is one that broke down pretty good, but you got some nice volume coming in today. Took it back up into the 65-day exponential. I don't know if that becomes shortable here. I suppose if the market rolls over and breaks down further tomorrow, that might be the case. But uh, you can see that it's pushing back up. The problem here is you have pretty heavy volume, so it might uh, imply that this would carry further. So this one, I wouldn't be coming in necessarily to short a year, uh, although people do ask me about that. Apple, I noticed today, what it's done here is this is a pretty ugly pattern. And to me, this is a head and shoulders formation, head and shoulders top. But remember, Apple is a big uh, favored stock. It's widely owned. And even if institutions are unloading it at 15 times estimates, there's a possibility that you might have value funds and other types of value buyers see this as cheap as it comes down in here. What I noticed, uh, I even noticed today, is that it didn't want to break the low here, and it was holding these lows as well, and so it's holding the 330 level. So it seems to me that it's going to try and rally one more time uh, back up here, and we'll see what happens here. But it is, uh, it did pick up a little more volume today, so it may try and push back to the upside from here. Uh, as I told you yesterday, I had a short position, and I just covered it because it didn't seem to be breaking. Down, it wasn't rolling over in the volumes picking up, so it looks to me like it might try and rally further. And you're also in position for that to occur with the NASDAQ composite being uh, right at its 50 day moving average. Uh, Tipco is a stock we've been talking about. There was some noise this morning about having talks with Hewlett Packard, and that turned out to be a bust if you're buying into that sort of news. And that's not something I would recommend doing. Uh, buyout rumors, uh, buyout talk. Uh, if you're buying on that, that sole basis rather than buying proper buy points this is a pocket pivot or a breakout you're asking for trouble so uh, I would be careful with that sort of thing um, you know other stocks that were breaking down today uh, fast and all I could just go go through a list of these things you know on the um, semiconductor side you have Texas Instruments and we had this other one uh, I forget which one it was this one was another uh, cheap semiconductor and it broke down and I think the other one was FSC another cheap semiconductor they had pocket pivots but they've broken down so I think a lot of this probably hinges around what's going on with Intel and Intel looks pretty ugly here uh, going into earnings I wouldn't be holding this stock and might even be a short here but it looks pretty ugly and so I don't really give the uh, semiconductor very much credence here uh, Omnivision Technologies broke down getting slammed, rumors about them uh, being replaced as a provider of uh, the uh, photographic uh, devices for the uh, iPad and iPhone. <clears throat> yeah, so basically, the SOX index has been, uh, has been one of the weaker index indexes uh, if you compare the SOX to any of the other majors like the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000. Yeah, and it's been uh, lagging. And I pointed out last week when we did our webinar that the fact that the SOX is lagging might be a problem for the market. It's not, not entirely clear, but usually, uh, you know, this also happened back in September when the market was launching. The SOX was, was lagging in October, the market was going higher. But uh, you have the same thing going on here. Well, the market's been able to rally up near its highs on the NASDAQ. The SOX is breaking down, and this may be a, a bad sign for the but it's still early, you know. If the market's going to break down, uh, you'll you'll know well enough. The evidence will pile up, and it'll become evident when that occurs. So, um, and I don't find that experimenting on the short side or trying to take some short positions here really uh, produces any real results. Uh, maybe for one day. So, if you want to day trade on the short side, I guess you might be able to make some money. But I don't really find that it's uh, really that optimal and that rewarding, really, to be to be quite honest. Um, as far as uh, bonds go, we saw a nice gap up in bonds, but the way I look at it, that just creates a buy opportunity in the TBT. So you could come in and buy the TBT here with the idea that it should hold. And it did hold above the lows, closed about mid-range. Uh, Dr. K, what's your take on bonds and the TBT? 
Well, I, I think that interest rates are inevitably going to head higher, and therefore um, the TBT, uh, which tracks well tracks uh, the inverse of, uh, of bond prices, TBT should go higher as well. Um, so I think over the longer term, TBT is a good investment. Uh, but keep in mind that that these instruments can trade sideways for prolonged periods. So in terms of your money value, your time value, it might not be the best option until there's more of a clear indication that it's really going to have a sustained rally. And then when it when there is that clear indication, I would I would recommend the TMV, uh, which is two x two times uh, ETF uh, version of. I'm just looking, reading through some questions here. Short Russell 2000, since it was the best performing asset class over the last 18 months. Short the Russell 2000. What's your take on that one, Dr. K? Well, my view is uh, that I, 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 yeah, IWM. I, I, based on risk reward analysis in conjunction with my model signals, uh, the Russell 2000 gives the best risk reward. So, in other words, on a buy signal, you would buy the IWM or you would buy the three times version of that, which is TNA. On a sell signal issued by the model, you would buy the inverse or you would just go short. You could short the IWM or short the TNA because you're going to get what I've noticed is the most um, the most performance on a buy or a sell signal issued by my model by, by investing in these types of ETFs. So uh, that's someone that someone thinks uh, it's time to go short uh, the Russell 2000. Um, I would I would have to say if, if the model were to issue a sell signal I would be in full agreement of that. Uh, but that said, we are in a, we st still are in a QE environment, and therefore uh, the market could very well find find its footing within the next couple of days and then start heading higher once again. So for now, the model remains on a buy signal, and the next stop, uh, the next next change in signal for the model will probably be a cash signal since since going. Going on the short side in this QE environment on ETFs is a very difficult uh, stack game. Yeah, and you might actually be looking at a buy opportunity in the IWM here, uh, or even using the TNA. Is uh, what is the TNA? A two two X or three X? The three X. Yeah, so you may even find that uh, this provides you with some opportunity to actually step in and buy these things, uh, actually, rather than uh, trying to uh, come in here and short the market. Like I said, I, I can get a good feel by trying to short a couple of things and see where they go. And when they just kind of persistently hold support and don't really break down, then you know you're not getting that much juice out of them. Even today, you know, yesterday I talked about CRM might be shortable, but look what it does. It breaks down. But you see how it goes through the 50-day moving average? If you're sitting here trying to short it, then it's going to bust. Well, all they do is close it near the highs of the day, and you're not going to go anywhere. And for all you know, this could hold support head back up to a uh, high, so you don't really know uh, what the deal is here. So uh, uh, my advice right now, and just because I've tried a couple of things to get a feel for it, and it's just uh, dinging me, I don't see any reason to really mess around with it. On the other hand, it's tough to uh, make things work on the long side, so you really have to be judicious in that regard. But you may be looking at a buy opportunity in the TNA, uh, in the IWM, and what I would urge you to do, rather than necessarily getting all bearish here, is to potentially look at this as a potential uh, buy opportunity as you come in because you are still in QE and you can feel in this market uh, the QE environment is still definitely uh, in there and it could, it could take the market higher. The other thing is if you do get this inflation play that can also push stocks higher uh, before uh, this is all over. So somebody says uh, no, don't short the Russell 2000, exactly. Somebody asking about LBS, it's not really rolling over here. And see, this is what I'm talking about. This came down, bounce up to today. Now you've rallied above the 50 day. Now everybody's going to think it's breaking down, but you're not really getting a lot of selling. It's not really breaking down. So the other one I was looking at, the BMW, notice how it looked like it might just roll over from the 50 day. And it did this morning, but notice how it got support and pushed up. Okay, so when you have your target short sale stocks, or rather your short sale target stocks, I should say. Uh, pardon my dyslexia. But your short sale target stocks, and they start to look like they're going to break, and then they do this, you're just sitting there, you know, just getting your head uh, 
pumped and you don't really need to be messing with that when you start to see that that's telling you that this doesn't want to go down and for all you know it's going to try and come out of here and make a new highs full of crm the other one that i thought was pretty ugly is uh f5 but again it doesn't really want to break and you're going into range i believe next week and the week after uh, and it may take that to uh, do something with the stock but for all you know the things going to rally back up to the day so i don't really see short selling here as an optimal activity and uh, while the long side is uh difficult dr k somebody says you're on fire tonight are you huh. on fire you light yourself well, it's, it's pretty. It's pretty warm here in London, and it feels like summer. So uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, have no complaints. I'm trying to feel that way here too. Buy LYB. Uh, it's right back to the uh, pocket pivot that we pointed out six or seven days ago. Actually, eight days ago now. Uh, it's possible it could be bought here. You didn't get real heavy volume coming down, but when Goldman comes out and tells everybody they got to sell commodities and commodities-related stocks. That takes everything down, but you have to remember it could just as well be that Goldman is providing you with a golden opportunity to be buying some of these things. Um, somebody says here, uh, hey, Dr. K, what do you think of this? With a good profit in CMG, do you continue to hold into earnings on 420? Yes, uh, I, I uh, use price volume action as my primary guide as to whether I'm going to um, buy, sell, hold, or firm in uh, the position. And in terms of earnings, the day before the earnings comes out, sometimes you will get a price volume clue as to the quality of the earnings report. Not always, but uh, ultimately, um, if, if I have a very big position in a stock that's about to report earnings, if I don't have a cushion in, in that stock, or much of a cushion, I would first ask myself, why do I have such a big position in the stock? Uh, and if I had, for some reason, I had such a big position, I would scale it down to a normal size position because the earnings reports uh, introduce a level of um, variability. Uh, stocks have been known to gap up or gap down on earnings reports, so you don't want to go into an earnings report with uh, with very little cushion in your in your uh, oversized position. So two rules yeah. I have is a normal size position in the earnings reports, or if it's oversized. You better your average cost in that oversized position better better have been uh, at least say 10 20 30 percent under where it's trading yeah and then all that is to say that if you just bought it here on this breakout or this pocket pivot here uh, you don't really have that much cushion so i wouldn't be really heavy into it going into earnings you're just rolling the dice uh, on that sort of thing ua did have pocket pivot today under armor I guess underwear is a big uh, or workout uh, type of uh, underwear or whatever it is that the you know what I actually have a few of their pieces but I use them like pajamas in any case they keep you cool and I guess they're pretty popular right now when, uh, when this thing is showing a pocket pivot today this actually doesn't look too bad right here what do you think is that viable right there Dr. K yeah I like it I so, think actually we should send the report uh, out on this one <clears throat> Somebody's asking about ARMH. Uh, that is a type of a pocket pivot as well. You know, it had a two gap downs is the only thing that makes me nervous about yeah, this stock. Yeah, that's um, the problem with it. Right there. So I would probably avoid this one. Even though that technically is a pocket pivot. So, but, but the gap downs one, two, and heavy volume make it uh, a little bit riskier. Priceline is just holding its 10-day moving average amazingly, and it really it hasn't budged very much at all over the past uh, few days as the market's come in pretty hard. So it's still acting pretty well. I guess they come out with earnings uh, in later on this month, uh, actually in May, on the, around the May 10th. So. That may may uh, continue to hold up and possibly even go higher. Let's see here. I'm looking at some other questions. It looks like we got most of them. I think the fact that I did uh, some webinars yesterday that we uh, recorded and put out that uh, most people 
have most of their questions answered, which is a good thing. It's 151, so we've been doing this for about 40 minutes or so. Uh, most people think that uh, commodities are probably going to turn and go higher. So I do think my game plan for now is we're going to hold on to our silver, and we're actually looking at uh, gold as being viable coming in here. Meanwhile, you may be uh, looking to buy opportunities here off the 65-day exponential if these are able to hold. GBC comes right back to the top of its breakout. That may be viable in here as it comes in. Uh, remember, Goldman Sachs, yeah, they make calls, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be right. Uh, they once said gold, uh, oil was going to 200, and that was way back right when it topped. I don't know. When, was that? when did that occur, Dr. K, when they said oil was going to 200? When did when did oil top, or when did it? Uh, yeah, they said uh, they put out a call. I think around in here back in July of uh, what, what was it? July, July 2008. 2008. Oh. Yeah, saying that oil was heading for 200, and that's what kind of got sparked this whole move. And of course, it never got even close to 200. So now they're telling everybody you need to be out of commodities. I don't understand why, just on the basis that they've had a good run. Is that what they're talking about? Because I almost think they have a maybe they have a hidden agenda because they need. I don't know. Maybe they they need to to manipulate the market with this kind of report uh, for some some strange reason, internal reason on their part. But it doesn't right. make any sense. Why? I mean, I guess they could they could make the statement. Well, commodities have run very very far, very quickly. Therefore, now is a good time to take some profits and then wait for the commodities to face and then fire again. That would that would make sense to me. But it, it, if they're saying that commodities are you know have are putting in a major top here, that makes no sense. No, and I don't see it either. And like I was saying earlier, I don't I don't see how uh, one would uh, think that the U.S. government is going to suddenly solve their budget deficit problem. I think that's kind of a uh, a, a misplaced uh, belief that they think that that's going to happen. And so on that basis, you have to think that even a pullback, if, if it was a sustained pullback in commodities, you'd want to be uh, buying that pullback. And that's how we would tend to look at it. So we're going to lay back and buy them. And if the SLB comes in uh, more than it has already, it may not even come in that much, uh, you may get your buy opportunity. But I'd wait for the 20-day moving average uh, to catch up probably. That's probably your best shot. It may, you know, it could do this little type of move here. Uh, about three weeks ago when it went sideways after having this reversal day. And I remember everybody was scared after we saw this move and people wondering, is this the exit signal to get out? And uh, Of course, we didn't think so. And I, and I don't think at long term, uh, for now, long term uh, view on silver, I, I'm sticking to my $50 price target, $50.50, which is the point and figure price target. I will be on Fox Business News tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, 6 p.m. London time. Is that right, Dr. K? All right, yeah, yeah eight, uh, four plus hours ahead, plus eight yeah, hours 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific, and I'll be talking about uh, silver, gold, and uh, and bonds. But I think for the most part, you want to uh, be trying to hold your positions and even look at pullbacks as points to add. And, and we'll see what happens with DBC. I don't think it's over for oil. Uh, if, if that's the case, then uh, that, that would seem to tell me that the dollar is going to be rallying. The dollar's actually made a new low today. So I don't really see that happening. Not that you could rally up and try to fill this gap. That's a possibility. But it looks um, it looks troublesome. And it looks to me like it's just telling you that it's in a prolonged uh, downtrend and it's going to stay there. Uh, we're getting some questions, so I'm going to finish up with some questions on stocks. If you have any, lay them on us now, and we'll get through them. Oracle has pulled back to the uh, breakout point. As I see it, volume's drying up close to the midpoint of its range uh, could become viable here. So you might look at that uh, as being a buy point right in here. We own it in the portfolio simulator along with AutoZone. Those are the only two stocks. Uh, and I felt Oracle was a good play in the portfolio simulator simply because it's a big cap stock, a big leader, strong earnings, and uh, more likely to hold up in a weak environment. Notice even though uh, the market sold off in the past few days, it's going to come in very orderly, so it's acting okay. Uh, IL was one that we had a pocket pivot on. Uh, they did a secondary offering here, and it held up pretty well. And notice how it's pulled in a little bit, and it's holding the uh, above the 10-day moving average, the magenta line, and also the 20-day, which is the green line, well above the 50-day here. You will notice, though, that this is a bit of a choppy stock. It doesn't really seem to uh, 
act in a very coherent or tight manner. And it looks like it's about 10% swings in this pattern. So to me, this is very difficult to hold. Uh, pay is uh, um, Verifone. Had a pocket pivot here, but that did not hold. It broke down along with the market that came in. Today, you pick up some volume. Dr. K, what's your take on this? Would you, if you bought on the thick pocket pivot here, would you be out of here? Well, if that was my initial position, um, it does violate the 10 day, uh, it's just two days later. So right. you either yeah. have the position there, the whole position. Uh, the market was in an uptrend uh, during that period. So it, it's all contextual. And if, if I bought there, I'd probably be selling half my position and now waiting, waiting and seeing what it does from there. Yeah, a little bit uh, tr tricky there. ERX is a three times energy bull. Oh God, that's pretty ugly. Is it viable off the 65 day moving average? It might be. What's your take on that, Dr. K? Uh, I would be careful using moving averages and um, and these 3X ETFs. Uh, I would right. go back to the roots and look at what the oil sector is doing um, without, without having a two times or three times uh, overlay. And then uh, judge based on the root uh, ask whether you want to risk more by buying into a two times or three times ETF. Yeah, because that, that's not really giving you a, a clear picture on, on that. Um, you're kind of buying a falling knife and you really don't know where it is. Uh, yeah, we didn't cover Netflix, but Netflix is uh, coming down, comes down to the 50 day and it's holding. I, I'm going to suppose here that it's just trying to build a handle. I guess it's not acting all that badly. It was pretty persistent today. On the upside, I really thought it was going to roll back over and it actually kept marching higher all day long. Uh, but you got a cup formation here and you're finally two weeks into a handle. So you know, it's possible that this is setting up to go higher. I know today it sure as heck didn't want to didn't want to roll over and it just seemed to have persistent bids under it all day long. So uh, coming off the 50 day. So this, this could uh, continue uh, to go higher and break out. Yoku is one that people are asking about. Uh, Yoku is a big, big ugly. I don't know what you call it. It's a big ugly, loopy double bottom type thing. It does close at the peak every week here. This is a weekly chart, and the volume's uh, not too bad here. But coming up, you close at the peak. Notice that, and it's holding up. I'm not sure what's up with the stock. This is what it looks like on a daily, but it's a very erratic stock. And you can see on an intraday basis, it can definitely swing around. Uh, Good six seven percent it looks like to me so it's very volatile but I, there's no earnings dr K, do you have any thoughts on this it's uh it's pretty wide and sloppy as it moves higher and i would be very careful um it's a speculative name and you know mm -hmm. simply because it uh, has no earnings and uh, it, it i guess it has great potential which is why it's trading where it's at but uh, you can see the way it went from 35 up to 55. It's a pretty wide band, a lot of volatility in there. And so unless you're prepared to stomach that kind of volatility, I wouldn't stay away from this kind of name. Yeah, and these guys aren't really making any money. I think earnings in the most recent quarter, they came in with uh, negative five cents. Uh, and next quarter, looking for negative eight cents. Interestingly enough, it does have 106 mutual funds uh, owning the stock, which is kind of unusual. I'm not sure what's going on here in terms of the story. Uh, but I don't really see any big uh, earnings growth right now. Now, there may be some big forward uh, type of uh, story here, but I don't really see it. And in 2012, they're estimated to lose three cents. So I'm not really sure what the big attraction there. The one I thought would actually be better. You know, if, if the stock were, were to settle down, nowhere. if if, uh, exactly. if Yoku were to uh, settle down, uh, if its price volume were become, to become more constructive, and then issue a pocket pivot, I would get potentially very interested because I do really like this story. And the fact that 20 million uh, shares are owned by institutions out of a 38 million share float mm -hmm. says to me that there's a lot of institutional interest that could drive this uh, stock a whole lot higher. Yeah, actually the float is uh, 69 million, Dr. K. I'm seeing, um, on one, I'm seeing uh, 38 million. And I'm seeing uh, I'm a total sure it's 69 million. Huh. What's okay. that? You must have the London version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in any case, that, that is a fair amount of stock for institutions to be in. And of course, you know the price action it keeps moving up, but it's it's a tough one to uh, 
to hold on to simply because uh, it's so volatile. So um, Slumber J is similar to, to uh, Baker Hughes and uh, Hal, which I talked about. These are all oil uh, equipment and service stocks. So it's broken down through uh, 65 day moving average. But for all you know, these can undercut the lows here and form some sort of double bottom formation. Uh, but again, you know, it's interesting what kind of uh, weight of, uh, Goldman has when they come in to make a call like that. They really hammered uh, all of these stocks. I mean, I looked at this one. This is one of my favorite ones, actually. It's been hammered, uh, and you've just seen a, a lot of uh, other oil stocks today just got creamed. So it wasn't really a pretty sight in the oil patch, as they like to say. It's more like a blood patch in the oil patch. Anyways. Let's see if we have any more questions here. Somebody was asking about AK. I got, uh, I got one here. Um, okay. Well, let's do the AK, uh, ACAS. AKAS. Um, that's a cheap little stock. American Capital. Um, they're just money management firm. Looks like they provide investment capital um, and invest in senior mezzanine debt equity, middle market companies. Ah. Uh, I don't know. This doesn't uh, turn me on. How about you, Dr. K? Yeah, I don't see anything here. Not into it. No. What was the other question you had? So, yeah, I got an email um, about the. It says, is there anything with ULTA chart that shows that a minor pullback to the 10 day moving average may be in store? Um, and, well, my, my response is that stocks and uptrends. Do pull back to their 10-day most of the time, especially during weak markets. And the fact that today was a weak market and ULTA still managed to stay above the 10-day, so I, I think that's a sign of strength um, and potentially continued strength in the stock. The pattern looks excellent. <clears throat> yeah, that's very strong. Caterpillar uh, coming down along with all the other commodity-related stocks. Kind of looks to me like it's heading right back to the top of the day. So watch and see what it does. You know, I, I think anything could happen in the market right now. You can see the market sell off more. You can see it try and bounce here. So you're gonna have to try and keep an even uh, psychology here, not get too bearish, uh, not get too too bullish. Uh, I tend to want to get bullish uh, when the market's up and then it pulls in, and then I want to get bearish and then it turns around and it goes back up. So this market tended to, to give you a, a neck uh, whiplash if. Uh, you try to lean too far one way or the other. So uh, I think you want to just stick with what's been working. And I think the stocks that we've been covering here uh, today that have some of the pocket pivots probably look pretty good. Um, the UA, good one, CMG, uh, all the earnings coming up, AutoZone also uh, pocket pivot today. And I'm not sure about these Zoomies. I've seen these stores, but I think this pattern is not it's, it's kind of choppy you have a lot of downside volume in the pattern i don't really care much for that i'll see that green mountain may be worth the crack here uh, and it may break out and move uh, move higher break out of this range that it's been in this ascending flat any other questions i think we're going to wrap it up here uh, make sure we covered everything. I think I uh, we got most things covered yesterday with the webinars uh, on GoView.com. It's uh, by the way that's still a beta test product, so we actually are being able to use it for free as beta testers. And so it does have you know some of the bugs and uh, gold. Somebody asked real quick. I already covered that, but I'll just reiterate. You pulled in right to the top of the base here. So to me, it looks like you just sit with it, or or you come in and you can buy it here. And that would be the DGP. Uh, and somebody called gold today the uh, the high road uh, when it, of uh, precious metals, I guess, the higher road of precious metals. But I don't know. You know, to, to me, if I compare the chart of the DGP to AGQ, I mean, just looks to me like the high road is what the silver has been doing. So that's the stronger one to try to pick off on a pullback. And notice also that it did not pull back very much at all today, whereas the EGP pulled back a lot more on a percentage basis. And also within its pattern, it's not really, uh, hasn't really broken out and gained any kind of upside momentum. So we're getting a couple more questions here. We're going to just kind of 
some of those. RCL is a short. Uh, that's that's actually in a shortable position. Uh, the question is whether that's going to be successful because you have come down a ways and you may have formed a head here and here's your left shoulder, but a lot of times if you're breaking down, this may take some more time. What will cause it to break down will likely be a breakdown in the general market. So, so Ryan, you want to be watching, I going to ask the question for it, yes, Ryan. Uh, you want to be watching the general market at the same time. If the, if the NASDAQ breaks down uh, through its, uh, let's see, yeah, or if the S&P, say, breaks down, If we do get a breakdown through the 50 day and the NASDAQ also moves lower, then we might see some of these shorts uh, potentially work. But right now, it's something like uh, RCL. <clears throat> yeah, that is in position. It's right up into uh, resistance. Whether it actually works is another story altogether. And I think it's going to depend on the market. But yeah, it is. It is in a uh, position to short. If you were in a bear market, it'd be definitely would be a short. So, anyways, uh, that's all we have for now. Any last questions? Maybe ten seconds before we sign off. Doctor K, any last thoughts to add? Uh, no, I think uh, it's a it's a bifurcated market, so uh, challenging as always. But that that keeps a, keeps it interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, and also, we will be coming up. Uh, AGQ, where is yeah, AGQ just pulling back, Shane? Uh, so it's not really not in a buy spot yet. But what we just noticed is that it's acting strongly. So AGQ and SLB do the same thing. AGQ is two times. Um, but anyways, uh, we'll be doing some uh, more of these webinars on GoView as we get the technology worked out. So hopefully you'll be able to get some out of that. I hope that helped you all yesterday. Uh, and gave you some idea of what we were thinking intraday. Um, and so we will be continuing with more of those as we expand the webinar service uh, to make it more valuable to all of you. I want to thank everybody for signing up. We uh, have been continuing increasing subscribership there. Haven't hit our limit yet, but we're going to get close soon. And, uh, and so we're looking forward to trying to expand it and uh, increase the quality. All right, everybody, uh, thanks for showing up, and we'll catch you next time. All right, take care. Take care.